In this episode of Detroit Performs, ice sculptors, an encaustic painter, and the art of balloons. It's all ahead on this edition of Detroit Performs. Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Detroit Performs. I'm your host, DJ Oliver, and I am really excited. Maybe just a little bit cold, but I could not be more thrilled to be at the Plymouth Ice Festival. I'll be browsing around all these incredible ice sculptors throughout the show. But first up, Tayana Rokar is a world championship ice sculptor whose work is on display here in her studio, Ice Dreams, which is only a short ways away. I think many times it, it just shows your dreams and that's what you're looking in eyes, you know, what you're dreaming too, you know, so it's, it's magical. Each of us is completely different and that's what I try to create in every ice carving what I do. I'm originally from Croatia, that's where I grew up and uh, come here looking for something better, <laughs> as always. <laughs> so I find um, ice, we are actually chefs. We do cooking and um, ice carvings were just part of the Sunday branches. So that's how I started. And uh, I started to carve, you know, the little cheese and, and uh, fruits, vegetables, you know, these little flowers from it. And that's how it started. It's different, you know, the ice is cold, but it can show so much more than regular clay. It's physical too, and you have to have certain energy to carve it. And I, I like that. These are sculptures uh, now for the Plymouth Ice Show. They're gonna be displayed at some of the clients and vendors there who requested them. So I'm very happy that I could come there and sculpt it. Many times there is a certain design from clients, what they want, what to carve. But if I get the cho uh, you know, choice what to carve, you just go in front of the block and you just See what's in there and you just start carving and uh, you find what's in inside of that block you have to visualize it you know the whole piece how it's gonna look when it's done and what you see in front of you is just block of ice you know square blank first you make your the, the little you know outline and then like a template i don't use much of the you know already pre-drawn templates i just go in and i start carving but i do make that that little template on it you, you could call it. And then you start taking away all these, um, you know, extra parts which don't belong to, to show the picture you had in your head when you started. It's fairly physical, you would say. I mean, the block of ice, it started as a 300 pounds and, and, and the chance is heavy and it's cold. And it's nine degrees over here. You have to move stuff around. So it definitely has its sets of challenges. You have to just keep going, you know, you, you, you have to carve quickly <laughs> and just get that, uh, that image what you imagine out of that block, you know, as fast as, as you could. Your image might change, so you have to, you know, be fairly quick, you know, to, to present it and, and to carve it out so it stays there. That's the whole nature of this ice, <laughs> just being fairly quick <laughs> and it, it, it keeps you warm. I use the chainsaw to carve out the majority shape, you know, of the eyes. Then uh, lay it around for more intricate work to uh, smooth down the surface and to carve it a little more in. I use the sander. Then uh, there is the chisels, you know, which I use if I want that it looks, you know, more like a crystal and, and you know, it shapes it more. Then also the die grinders, which, you know, adds like the fine details, like an eyes, like a little swirl is around, you know, hair, you know, all this, you know, final details, that's what I use. And on the end, um, I use the torch, you know, the fire to melt down the surface to make it to look like a glass. I do like the crystal look, you know, the, the ice is clear and I try to show the, the clearness and purity of the ice too. 
we produce our ice blocks here in the studio. Basically, this is the machines, the ice block makers, where we make our ice. The average take three to four days to freeze block of ice. They come 300 pounds. This is actually ready ice to be harvested for the ice carvings. So it will take, uh, we'll hook them up on these two clips and uh, lift them out. Some of the blocks I freeze the items inside and then I carve around it. Like for the weddings I had um, ice cubes and there is an orchid frozen inside so it's one flower, you know, inside and it's all beauty so it's, it's kind of different <laughs> look to it. For brides majority, you know, they like initials or, or the hearts or, you know, anything romantic. <laughs> Well, the corporate parties, you know, they, they like more their logos and less of the details on it because, you know, it needs to show their logo. My husband, Paul, you know, he always helps me around. He helps me a lot, you know, with the deliveries, with ice productions, with logos which have to be done on the CNC. There is lots of different work which doesn't involve exactly carving ice, but uh, they have to be done. On Alaska, the blocks tend to be very big, so you can create a really large ice carvings. Some of the ice carvings are about 30 feet tall, so it took us four people for a whole week to carve on Alaska. It takes lots of preparation to coordinate, you know, all four carvers to, to come together and to carve that one piece, one dream. The first year we made the big pretenders where there were like two little colts. They were f uh, play fighting, right? You know, like two little kids, and, and they were imagining like that, those two big horses, you know, unicorns right up there on, on the top, and, and they're just with, with all their, you know, glory. <laughs> so it, it takes lots of, lots of work and imagine, imagination to, to come and to present that. You try to show the power, you know, what is inside of these. Uh, it's not just a block of ice anymore, you know. It's they, you know, they have to, they have to look like they're big and powerful. When you look at the ice carvings, you can see different things. So it's completely up to the viewers to see. Also, there is kids. There is always kids around, and they go and they see. Oh, look! There is a dragon. You know, there is a little goldfish. There is fairy and it just forms your heart you know when you hear that so you just have to continue so I like to be here <laughs> uh, for me the worst today is <laughs> to go out and, and <laughs> be and <laughs> do the paperwork <laughs> I pray why I love to be here and, and um, just stay in the freezer and carve You can learn more about Tayana Rokar as well as all the artists we feature on DetroitPerforms.org. Artist Paula Zamet embraces the ancient and labor-intensive art of encaustic painting. Take a look. So Corktown Studios is an artist collective here in North Corktown and it consists of eight artists all working in different mediums and we are really so supportive of each other's art. I think art, when you take the time to look at it, it slows us down and pulls us away from life. Things that get us so busy and constantly moving and in motion and thinking about the next thing that we have to do or to complete or to be successful at. And with art, there aren't those parameters. It's, it's something that can be very, very personal. Um, for me, it, it is very personal, and it's also um, a way that I take care of myself. So one of the mediums that I work in is called encaustic. Encaustic is a mixture of be natural beeswax with Damar crystals, resin, added to it. It's melted together at a very low heat. This is my clear medium, which is being remelted from the prior session. 
Uh, this is the mixture of beeswax with the Demar resin, and I always keep a certain amount of this without the pigment added to it so that I can achieve a translucent look to my layers as I fuse them together. So to add pigment to the clear medium, I'm gonna place a, an amount on the pancake griddle, and then I have a choice of either adding powder Or there's many times where I'll go in with an oil stick and that adds a very concentrated amount of pigment as well. <clears throat> it's actually a very ancient technique. It's been around for a couple thousands of years. The Fayum mummy paintings, which a few are found in the Detroit Institute of Arts, are painted in this method. And because the beeswax acts as a preservative, the pigments look just like the day that they were painted. They retain a ton of depth and vibrancy. My intent, I think I'm very happy when a viewer looks at these pieces and the first thing they do is say, oh, I want to touch it. Because I feel like it's been a successful piece then, I feel like there's something very intriguing about it that's pulling the person in. Why is it that they want to touch it? They want to know what it feels like. Is it, is it hard? Is it soft? Is it going to move? Um, I think this is a technique that you can create very organic looking pieces with. And it's a medium that offers that like no other medium does. Gallery Camille is located in Midtown Detroit and one of the primary focuses of the gallery is to showcase and promote Detroit-based artists both in Detroit and outside of the city. We're happy to represent Paula Zamet. She has a diverse body of work painting with both oils in a figurative style and with encaustics, which is a very ancient and labor-intensive form of art, to create abstract pieces. This really adds to the scope of work that we're able to show at the gallery. To me, body language is so interesting, and I did not want these pieces to be about what's the facial expression, what are her eyes doing, and I think as human beings, we're really drawn to people's eyes and looking at the face. And I wanted these pieces to be so much about the gesture and the body language and just that hint of sensuousness, you know, not in an overt way, like we see constantly in modern media nowadays. I wanted there to be that, that softness there that femininity, but in a, in a sophisticated sexuality kind of way. For me, whenever I do anything that's more abstract versus my figurative pieces, I love hearing what everybody else, the viewers bringing as much to the table as me as the artist, the producer of the work. You know, depending on what your life experiences have been, what you've been exposed to, have you spent a lot of time out in the woods, have you spent a lot of time near the water, you're, you're gonna see different things when you look at these pieces. So I don't, I don't like to tell anybody what they're supposed to be seeing when they look at that. Some really rough days, for sure, where I was close to tears, but you just get back out there and, and do it. And the result has blown me away. I had no idea that I was capable of this and to have not a, have discovered this, even though it's later in life, I, I, I can't even imagine now. My life has changed completely, 180, yeah. What's up, guys? I am here with James Geaton, the organizer of this festival here. How are you doing, James? Good, how are you? I'm doing good. So tell our Detroit Performance viewers out there a little bit about this festival and how it came to be. Well, this is a 35-year uh, tradition right here in downtown Plymouth. Uh, 
It started with a uh, couple of business owners wanting to do something in the slow economic time of the year, so they came out and carved ice, and uh, here we are 35 years later uh, with a full-blown festival. All right, so you have some incredible ice sculptors here. How do you get the ice sculptor to come here? Well, uh, over the years, this, uh, this festival has drawn ice carvers from all around the world. Uh, it was at one point international ice carving uh, teams were here as well. Um, so I, I don't really know what it is. I think a lot of it has to do with the, the city. The city is an absolute beautiful place to be and an absolute fun time uh, to come hang out in. So what else can you do here at the Ice Festival besides saying ice sculptors? Uh, we can, uh, you can come down and cross country ski. We have a cross country ski trail. We have a uh, dueling chainsaws competition where uh, we have uh, 15 minutes and uh, give a couple of ch carvers uh, a couple of chainsaws. There's a couple of different warming stations as well, so there's plenty to do for the whole family. Okay, I like those warming stations ideas. So how's the, this uh, festival impacted the surrounding community here? Uh, it, this it brings a lot of people to town throughout the weekend, so it really does help businesses make it through to the spring. So. Uh, when there's something pops up in the middle of the winter, one of those unexpected expenses, money they make this weekend will help them get through uh, the rest of the winter until the spring when uh, shopping picks back up. All right, so what's the future of this festival? What do you want it to happen? Bigger and better, more ice carving. We'd like to bring back a professional ice carving competition so we just don't have our collegiate competition anymore. So we grow that a little bit okay. and uh, always bigger ice. That's what it's all bigger about ice. anyways. And more warming stations. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you so much, James, for talking to us. We appreciate that, man. No problem, thank you. All right, now let's go some upcoming events happening in and around the D. To discover more events in Greater Detroit, visit ICSITY.com. Aragami specializes in creating large-scale installations entirely out of balloons. The art combines storytelling and visual artistry to capture the attention of audiences worldwide. Take a look. There are a number of things about balloons that I really enjoy. A balloon is a toy, and from the time we're little, we're taught that we can play with balloons. So to be able to create art with something that people already think of as a toy makes it so much more fun and enjoyable. And there's nothing sad about a balloon. You look at a balloon and you laugh, and, and you see the, the fun nature of it. Another piece about balloons that I love is just the temporary nature. When you have something that's temporary, people look at it very differently. They don't, they don't look at it and say, oh, I'll come back and see it later. They want to take in everything they possibly can right now before it changes. We create large-scale installations, fine art and commercial illustrations, and stop-motion animations entirely out of balloons. What we specialize in is more of an experiential event rather than you know, a, an actual physical piece of artwork just because it does disappear at the end of it. It's amazing the amount of logistics that goes into a project like you know, the Aragami Balloon Adventure. We not only have to try and calculate how many balloons we might possibly use, but we have to figure out you know, how many crew members we're going to have, what are their skill sets, what do we think we can pull off in four days, 
and make sure that we have you know, just enough materials that you know, we're not going to run over and have you know, boxes left over of uninflated balloons, but we're not going to run out of things for them to do either. We'll come up with you know, some basic concepts of elements that we want to include in the piece with some pretty detailed engineering plans, but then there's lots of room for you know, our crew members to have some creativity and add elements where you know, they see a piece of the story that maybe isn't completely fleshed out. You know, they can add a piece. Without the input of everybody, it really would be not the same sculpture. The things we work on are so varied from the, the huge community building projects that involve you know, hundreds of people to the other end of it are the really tiny things that we do for ourselves. Um, the, the fine art illustrations that we do where it's just two of us in working off of a blank slate and creating original, imaginative stuff, illustrating a kid's book. It's funny too, because like we're writing the book, we're like, what happened to the wolf at the end? We can't kill him, we don't want to pop him, that would be terrible. So. Art is this really, it's almost like a club that you need to, to belong to to understand certain types of art. Balloons are accessible. Balloons are something that people play with. So we work in a medium that allows people to play and enjoy and smile. We love that they take away from our art what they wish to, not what somebody has told them they need to. And that wraps it up for this edition of Detroit Reforms. As always, for more arts and culture, head to DetroitReforms.org, where you'll find featured videos, blogs, and information on coming arts events. Also, check us out on Facebook and Twitter. A huge thank you to the Plymouth Ice Festival letting us come out here today. Until next Tuesday, get out there and show the world how Detroit performs, y'all. I'm DJ Oliver. Thanks for watching, guys. Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs, and the National Endowment for the Arts, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.